Hi, everyone. I just want to start by introducing myself. I'm John Adeojo, founder and chief data scientist at Data Centric Solutions. So today I just want to do a quick tutorial on OpenAI's function calling. I think it's an extremely useful paradigm, but I think that many people still misunderstand it or don't quite get the benefits of function calling. So hopefully this tutorial today will give you a better idea of how it's useful and specifically the opportunities that it can open up to you for developing your own large language model-based applications. Let's get into it. I have a Jupyter Notebook open here that I prepared earlier. Now this notebook is going to be available for you to explore yourself on my GitHub page. I'll post a link to that in the description below the video. So the first thing to note that when you open this GitHub notebook, sorry, this uh, Jupyter notebook is that there's some utility functions here. That's for reading the API key. And so I provided a .yaml file where you'll need to present your own OpenAI token. Once you present it in that file, you need to do nothing else. You just simply can run this notebook end to end and begin exploring and playing with it for yourself. All right, so what are we doing here? Let's just talk at a high level first and then we'll get into the the technical details. The primary goal of function calling, really, you can think of as turning an unstructured input into a structured input. So that by that we mean a natural language input, so a query by a user to your app into a structured one. The beautiful thing about that is we can use it on top of APIs. So those APIs can contain useful data sources that might be useful for our app user. For example, it could be news headlines, it could be weather data, it could be airplane flights, you name it. You can imagine the vast array of APIs out there now. So for this example, I've built, I've modeled some APIs. They're not real APIs, they're just models to illustrate the usefulness of function calling here. So I've got two in particular. There is a an API I've modeled to generate news headlines, and you can see that on screen now. It's really simple. The first function is just an API call to OpenAI. And you can see it just says generate a random news headline based on a topic. So that topic will need to input to the model, but once it has it, it will just generate some, some random, it'll be fake, but what we need for the purpose of this tutorial. And then here, the second function is to get the current news headline. So that works off the generated news, news headline and just supplies us with a dictionary with the news headline. The other function I have is just below this one, and this is to get temperature. So it's modeling a weather API. So we've got a function here that provides some random temperature reading based on time and date. So this is completely nonsensical, obviously, but the point is to just give, give some temperature reading when we call this API. And then it's returned to you again in a in a dictionary format. So that's how we, how we get it here. So that get temperature is modeling some kind of web API that might exist out there and you want to call. So how does function calling help with all of this? Essentially, with our function call, we can set up the we can set these functions up in an API in an API framework given to us by OpenAI. And that will allow us to return the arguments of those functions that we want to call later down, this, um, later down or downstream from our code. What do we mean by that? Let's just have a look at the arguments again. Let's have a look at the functions. So this get temperature function, if you imagine, is modeling a weather API that might exist out there. It takes two arguments, location and date. A user can query this API by providing the location and date directly, which is a traditional method, and you need to give them a structure to do that. Or now with function calling, they can actually provide a natural language input saying something like, can you get me the weather in X location at Y time, for example. And with function calling, we can pass that information out in a structured way so that we can then pass that to the get temperature function. So the best way is to really, to the best way to, to illustrate this is to show you directly. So I'll start by running <clears throat> all the functions above have been pre-run by the way, but I will first run the function call. So let's talk through it. 
apologies, here's the function call. So what we have here is we give the name of the function that we're trying to call, which is get temperature. And then under the parameters, this is the key section really, we've got our two arguments that we were talking about, the location and the date. But notice the description. So we give a description of the location, which is return a location cited in the query. We also give a type, so the model knows what, or the, the function call knows what type we're expecting to return. And it's the same with the date. We give the description, and here what's interesting is we've specified the exact format that we want that date to be returned. So we're already getting a lot of control over what is returned by the function call. The next part is, is pretty key to understanding how this works too. So you might recognize the chat completion API. That's just the standard API that if you've been playing around with OpenAI for some time, you might have used. But here's the addition. This functions, we're passing that function dictionary into the chat completion API. So that's priming the model to know that, look, we want to start using function calls here. We're not asking for a traditional chat completion or generative response. The next thing is the function underscore call argument. Now, so parameter. So that the function underscore call parameter we've set to auto. This is where the LLM's intelligence actually comes in because what we're able to do or what the model does is decide whether or not based on the query to use this function call or not. So sometimes the user might put in a query that relates nothing to the function that we're getting. So, you know, we, we want to get the temperature. The user might put in a query that is to do with going out to the cinema, for example. That's nothing to do with getting temperature. So function call also can help the help tells the model to decide whether or not to use the function call or not based on the query. So that comes in handy, especially when you have multiple functions that you're trying to call. And I'll demo that a bit later on in the video. So let's run that and let's just play with it and see what happens when we run a query against that. So our function call for one function, we've got API key registered there already. And if we hit run on that, so based on this query, what's the temperature in Berlin on the 1st of September, 2023? Our function call returns this, and it's a JSON object. And what we've got here under arguments is the location, <coughs> which is Berlin, and the date, which is 2023-09-01, which is exactly what we're looking for in the form that we're looking for as well. Now, that's fantastic because that's a structured response, and we're guaranteed to get a structured response every single time we make that function call. The, the good thing about a structured response is that we can then take this JSON object and pass out those arguments and feed them into our function. And I'll show you what that looks like a bit later on. So what does this look like with two functions? Uh, interestingly enough, you're going to have some use cases where you, you have multiple functions. You don't just have one. So it might be an API. It might be a, uh, an interface, a UI, that sits on top of multiple APIs containing different data sets. So in this example, I've got the web API and the news API as well. All I've done here is add the additional function into that dictionary, and everything else actually remains the same. So where we just had the get temperature function before and all of the arguments and parameters that come with that, now we also have the get current news function. Fantastic. So if we run this, Paying close attention to this, we've also set function underscore call to auto. What's really clever about this is it can actually select which function it should use based on the query itself. So instead of just saying we're going to use the function call or not, it will select which function is appropriate based on the query. Let's give it a try and see how it works. So we've got a few queries here. Query one, what's the temperature forecast in NYC at the end of September 2023. Query two, give me the latest headline news on Berlin. And query three, what's 10 plus 10? Great. So if this works how we want it to work, the function call should report, return what is required for each query. So let's try based on query one. So fantastic. So it's recognized that it's the get temperature function that we want. And you can see that called here. And then the arguments that come through are location, 
which is what we want, New York City, and the date, which is 2023 09 so the end of September, and that's what we requested in the query. Fantastic. So let's move on to query two. So it's recognized that we want to get current news function and the topic is Berlin, which is correct. And if you see on the query two, we can see give me the latest headline news on Berlin. So our topic here is Berlin. So let's see what happens when we do query three. Should actually we just made a small error in the code there. So let's do query three and spoil response. And we'll have to rerun that because I've overwritten it. And we'll do that again. Fantastic. So as you can see, query three doesn't return anything because the well, it returns 20. So it doesn't return a function call, it just returns the response to our question because it's the, the model has recognized that it's nothing to do with getting the current news or getting the temperature. It's just a simple request to the model. So this really just illustrates the flexibility of this thing. You can have a function call that acts when it's supposed to and just acts as the normal LLM when you need it to. There is also a way to control it. So you can direct it to specific queries as well, just by setting that auto to the name of the, the, the function that you want to call. Right, so you might not be convinced up till now that function calling is actually worth anything because you might be saying to yourself, well, that's all great, but why can't I just create a prompt template and get the chat, uh, the chat completion API to return me the arguments just like you would do with a function call? And the truth is you can do that, but it's just not anywhere near as flexible and you will run into edge cases that function call could deal with but you won't necessarily be able to deal with using that approach. So I'll give you an example here. Uh, let's take the news headline one, for example, where we want to return a topic. So this is just the chat completion API, and we're asking to return the topic based on the query. So that should hopefully make sense to you. No function calling here. So we can run this, and then we will run the function itself. So you can see the response here is the news topic required is Berlin. That is the correct answer, but you may notice something. Where this is an unstructured response, when we get the function call, it's actually a structured response. Now that means it's, actually, it's a lot easier to pass that into a function later down the line. It's quite difficult to pass the, the unstructured response and we can't guarantee how the model is gonna respond either. It might respond saying, the, the topic is Berlin, it might respond, giving us a long-winded answer and saying, Berlin, we don't know. There's no guarantees about how that model responds to different queries. So what function calling does is two things, really. It gives us a, a structured response that we can easily pass those arguments from, which gives us a measure of control over what we're doing. And it also gives us a level of consistency. So lastly, I did say I would demo the how to pass those arguments from the JSON object that we get returned from the function call into variables that you can then use to call the functions that we will use downstream. So before covering that, it's important to know that function calling doesn't actually call, it doesn't actually activate those functions. It's not running those functions. It's only grabbing the arguments to feed to those functions downstream. The LLM doesn't have an engine native to actually run functions. So it's important to be aware of that. You can't use function calling to run the functions. It's just simply to extract those arguments in a structured way. Okay, so now that's clarified. What's it, how do we get those arguments into variables so we can run functions downstream? That's pretty easy. We return the same format every single time. And I, I guess the only risk to this is if OpenAI changed the API at some point when they've done an upgrade and changed the structure. But at that point, you just probably need to analyze that and look at that structure again and adapt your, your method of passing those variables. So first, let's just take a look at the, the response that we get from the function call. So we can see it's this JSON object returned from 
OpenAI. So it's an OpenAI object. And we can isolate this. So how we do that is to first um, select the, the correct keys here, so the function call and the arguments key. And then we can pass that to a JSON, um, to a Python JSON file. So I'll run that. And I just want to give you a flavor of what that response looks like when we get the, when we run the pass output. So we've got the response. The response comes from the function call itself, right? So that is, apologies. Yeah, so this is our, this is our response as I, I was showing earlier. So that's the same as, as this, we run that through our pass function, and we get that response here. So I just I want to just show you what this looks like by itself, so you, you get an idea. So what that does is it will isolate the two arguments. It would is isolate the argument for us. So we've got topic Berlin because we're talking about res passing response one here. So that should. Let's do that again. So if I run this, and then I pass this just to show you. There we go. So that leaves us with the arguments alone in the dictionary. And then from there, it's just about calling the key, just as you would do any other dictionary comprehension. So you've got your location, and you've got your, your date there. And you just do that by calling the key. Just to show that to you there you go so now you have that variable and you can pass that into the function of your choice and i have done that so just to tee things up let's do the get current news function so here we go so we return a a dictionary with topic berlin and a headline berlin launches innovative green transportation initiative to combat air pollution now of course this is completely made up but just to show you what function calling has done for us there we've gone from that natural language input to say, a um, two arguments and then we pass that into a function that takes those arguments and return the response from our api so you can imagine a few use cases for this if you if you were to if you're exploring yourself and just for completeness, we'll do the final one. So this is the get temperature one. And we can see the location has been passed in there nicely. So we've got New York City date, um, which is the end of September. And then we've got a temperature returned from our API and this scale, uh, which is the Fahrenheit. So I've got more information on this on the technical blog I've written, again, which is going to be available um, as soon as it's published on Medium. I'll put the link for that in the description underneath the video. As I mentioned before, the GitHub project is available. So this notebook will be available for you to use yourself. You will require an OpenAI API key. The instructions for getting that, I will put in the technical blog as well, if you don't already know. But a quick Google search should suffice on that as well. It's not difficult to set up. And that's pretty much it. You will probably need a, a, a way to run your notebook. I'm, I believe you could probably run this in a collab, although I haven't tried to call the OpenAI API from a Google collab yet. There might be some, some issues there because it's actually running on a remote server. So try doing it locally first. You don't need, you just need somewhere that you can run a Jupyter notebook. And yeah, it's all yours to play with. Thanks for tuning in again. If you liked what you saw today, please like, please comment, and please subscribe. It really helps the channel out. I'm looking forward to delivering the next video. And please give me any suggestions on any content that you would like to see on the channel or anything you would like me to write about. Appreciate you tuning in. Thank you.